Good afternoon. I hope you guys had a nice lunch. So now we're going to talk about how you can make your enterprise safe and secure and uh, avoid vulnerability with uh, usage of some of the a AWS services, service catalog and control tower. Control tower got, um, uh, uh, I mean, was uh, gen made generally available this morning. So that was a big announcement from our perspective. So we'll talk about how these services can help you avoid misconfigurations in your enterprise and keep your enterprise safe. So with that, um, I wanted to quickly go through the agenda. I uh, wanted to introduce our customer from World Bank, Yugao, aka Andy. He'll be talking about how World Bank has gone about deploying DevSecOps and how they use these services to mitigate misconfigurations. And Darren, who's our senior solutions architect, is going to be talking about uh, how the architecture of the services that have been deployed um, look, and he'll be doing a little demo for us. Yugao is a senior IT officer at, uh, at the World Bank with a focus on security. <clears throat> so quickly, to give you guys an overview of Service Catalog and Control Tower, Service Catalog is a one of the governance and management services of AWS. And it is essentially used to deploy curated catalog of services. It's, it is used to establish governance as well as control um, over the deployment of AWS services. It, it also helps in establishing a handshake between the central IT organization, and the end user groups. The end user groups could be developers, it could be lines of businesses, and the central IT organization essentially encompasses the chief information security officer's organization, the CIO's organization, or even the cloud program office or cloud center of excellence. Folks that look at ways in which the organization can centrally administer uh, services to the end users. The way it works is it is able to add a lot of metadata to AWS services around guardrails that need to go with each one of those services in terms of what can be launched, how much of that service can be launched, just doesn't limit itself to AWS services, but also deploys three-tier applications as well as you know, containerized applications, all with guardrails and very mature tagging. Now, by virtue of doing some of that, you are bringing in a layer of security. The second layer of security is brought forth by virtue of the fact that the end users are separated from the console. So once you've deployed what we call a portfolio of services that is targeted at an end user group, um, you essentially ensure that the end user groups do not have access to the console anymore. That helps the developers also be doubly sure of what they are entitled to, be, to use and how best they can put all these great tools to use and it is very easy for the administrator to add something to the portfolio or take something out of it. In that way, it fosters agility and uh, enables DevOps, and we will talk about DevSecOps uh, later today in the session. <clears throat> control Tower. How many of you have, uh, have heard about Control Tower? By show of hands? Cool, excellent. Um, so Control Tower was previewed at reInvent last year, and as I said, it went GA this morning. Uh, Control Tower is a way by which you can set up an automated multi-account environment. Something, if you guys are familiar with, uh, landing zones. Creating an automated landing zone is something that Control Tower does within 60 to 90 minutes. 
and it bakes into the automated landing zone the best practices that we have uh, developed over uh, one and a half years working with about 1,000 customers. So what do you get with Control Tower? The first thing is an automated multi-account environment setup that is enabled using services like AWS Service Catalog for uh, the account factory, AWS organizations predominantly which essentially houses all the accounts, um, uh, AWS Single Sign-On for secure access, also uh, CloudFormation stack sets for a multi-region kind of a de deployment. So all of these uh, are deployed out of the box once you deploy Control Tower. Policy enforcement is the second uh, uh, most important thing that goes with Control Tower. What it does is it enables certain guardrails. Some of those guardrails are um, mandatory, and some of them are strongly recommended. There is going to be a provision for bringing your own guardrails, which is something that we want to learn from our customers. And you know, as, as the product evolves, we would like to make sure that uh, the policy enforcement capabilities of Control Tower is also enhanced. And the third thing, which is all about giving you a good dashboard so that you know exactly as to what accounts are compliant, which ones are not, how many guardrails have been deployed, and where all those guardrails have been deployed, and which organizations and what sets of accounts. So you get a very uh, easy to use dashboard, and you get policy enforcement, and of course, you get an automated um, uh, you know, multi-account environment set up. With that, uh, let me invite Andy to talk about World Bank's experience in this whole area of uh, security. Thanks, Andy. Thank you, Kashik. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yu Gao, uh, AKA Andy. Um, I'm a senior IT officer with World Bank Group, particularly in the security architect team. So before I start, I want to uh, introduce you a little bit about World Bank Group. So what does World Bank Group do? So World Bank basically is a vital source of financial and technical assistance to developing countries around the world. And also World Bank, it's not a traditional bank. So basically it's Sorry, forming a unique Thank partnership you. which uh, working with uh, multiple country, member countries, to reduce poverty and support development. And also, the World Bank Group include a five institute and a government by the member country. So, World Bank Group is uh, established back to 1944, and currently have a total of 189 member countries, and we have about 10,000 employees uh, located in 122 offices worldwide. So based on the size, you can see we're a big organization. And also, we shared a lot of uh, uh, goals um, that are defined by our board. So for the World Bank goals, we have a two goals, primary, so end extreme poverty by decreasing the percentage of people living on less than a dollar and 90 cents a day to no more than 3% by the year 2030. And also we want to promote the shared prosperity by fostering the income growth of the bottom 40% uh, for every each country. So with those goals that a World Bank set, then you can imagine that we have a lot of IT related projects. Um, I, today I want to share some of the lessons that I learned that when we are going our cloud journey, especially using AWS Service Catalog and also the uh, AWS Control Tower. So like a lot of uh, big organization, we're facing challenges like you know, traditional waterfall process that usually that not able to meet the rapid change that uh, other business department that need. 
And the security usually involved at the end of the process. Usually the application team, they come to us for an approval at the end of project. And then sometimes that we fail, hmm, then when we learn the, their architecture design, we always say, there are something can be better, right? So um, also that we see the problem like, um, we define the security control, but the security control sometimes was manually, most of the time was manually done. And when things are manually done, it's not able to implement consistently. And sometimes uh, misconfiguration to happen. Um, for example, when our security team, we, we say we want to encrypt, ask the application team to encrypt an S3 bucket. There are indeed four different ways to encrypt an S3 bucket. You can use the default, you can use KMS key, you can use you know, your uh, custom manager key. So when we communicate it to, to our application team, sometimes, you know, things can lost in communication. And then, so that's caused some like a, a misconfiguration, which discovered right before the application ready to launch. Then we have to pause the application and cause some major delay. So. Those are common that in, in the past. Um, and also, you know, as a big organization, we are, have a lot of like how high volume demand uh, since we have a lot of line of business. Uh, as I mentioned, we have like a five different institute. Um, so those high demands, you know, come to us then usually if we address that manually, individually, we cannot really fulfill all the requirements. And also when we try to do the operation on the cloud world, then we have many, many accounts. And also, uh, we need to ensure that the policy is enforced across all accounts and across all the line of business. Then those are the challenges that we're facing. So how we resolve that? So we start our journey with security as code. So, um, initially, uh, in the World Bank, um, we already started the cloud uh, development back two years ago. Um, then we already have a like, good amount of confirmation templates available. Now, once when we security team join, we say, instead of get us involved at the end of your project, let's work together at the very beginning of the project. Then we come up with an idea after we consult with AWS. Uh, we have a, we develop the confirmation template with the application team together. When they address majority of their application needs and then we provide the security needs. And also we organize those confirmation template by separate them. You see on the right, on the left side of the slides that we have security stack and we have access stack separated from the application stack. And we can use the cross reference between those stacks. So as a security um, architect, I don't need to go look into your application stack too much. All I need to focus is security stack and access stack. So the security stack usually will include some like uh, security groups rule, right? And also some um, uh, policy rules, for example, if I want to have a fine-grained access control for a specific service which has the capability to define a policy for the, on the resource side, that's usually the place it goes to. Access stack usually goes for like a, a VPC NECO and also for a particular IAM role access, those role policy. So those are the area that we put together. And then we put it into an AWS confirmation template. And not only with the confirmation template, we move forward and we put those confirmation templates into AWS service catalog. Because those service catalog, we can achieve self-service with um, access control. And then we can use the same template shared between different line of business. And then with that effort, then we can achieve fully 
uh, infrastructure provision automation with our security contributing, then you can see that once the one API call made to the AWS service catalog, the entire stack that is come out. It has, for example, the first, uh, um, the first uh, stack that we work with our application team is a Fargate stack. It contain like an ECR and an ECS Fargate containers, load balancers, and an AWS RDS. And then we, our security stack include the security controls, permission control, IML roles. We have everything fine defined, fine grained and defined inside the code. And this code can be reused over and over again. Right. Now, when we address the infrastructure security for the underlying infrastructure, we secure the, the stack that the application is running. Now we need to address the application security. And we work, we look into the, uh, the native workflow for our existing CICD pipeline. So we believe that security needed to follow every step of the entire development process. As a developer, usually they will start with uh, developing code in their local IDE, and then they check in their source code into a source code repository, and then go through the CI CD process, and then start to build and have the binary, and then start to promote into individual environment. And you can see on the DevSecOps part that we embedded our hooks into every each step. So on the IDE, before even they commit their code, that we have the IDE plugin. And we also leverage the static source code analysis. And also we look into their dependency check. We do the dependency check for the vulnerability. And also we do dynamic scanning. And then once when it promoted, then we do like a small test and ongoing monitoring and testing. And with both picture put together, then we can achieve First, we secure the underlying stack. So on the infrastructure level, that we have all our security control in place. And on the top part, that we address our DevSecOps pipeline with our security hooks in place. So we codify the security control into infrastructure as a code. So, and then we leveraged uh, the AWS confirmation template. And also we embedded the security control into our CI CD pipeline. And also, don't forget, there is also ongoing monitoring. That is very important. Because sometimes your confirmation may be, you know, get modified or some like a drift that you needed to be captured by those ongoing uh, checks. All right, so for the next slides, I want to hand it over to Darren and to talk about some like key attribute of the service catalog. Thank you. Hey, Andy, appreciate it. <laughs> So while I'm talking, I'm going to start getting things set up because we're going to give you a little demo as well, so if you don't mind. A um, couple of quick questions for you, though. So who here believes that standardization is a key part of security in an organization? Thank you for raising your hands. Uh, <laughs> standardization is important because, for example, in the DevX, uh, DevSecOps pipeline process, how are you gonna know the name of a security group to call if you wanna validate that only one certain security group is accessible or approved for that pipeline for a certain application? You have to be able to standardize. So standardization is quite important and one of the great things with service catalog, as you see on the, oh, maybe I should click the slide forward. As you see on the slide for a service catalog, <laughs> standardization is uh, one of the key pieces, right? Being able to standardize the deployments that you have into a service catalog, catalog that your end users or your business uh, developers can consume to provide value to, your, uh, to, the, to the end customers, to the organization, whatever it is. So service catalog provides great value to customers in terms of the ability to standardize your configurations so that you can put, um, with co Control Tower, you put guardrails in place such that you can have a centralized security organization that can manage the risk for the organization, but you can have business units and developers that are actually bringing value to the end customers as well, so you can be secure and fast at the same time. And that, a lot of ways, is gonna be implemented through the capabilities of Service Catalog. Um, you can automate deployments, it's a one-stop shop. 
We'll show you a little bit about uh, the service catalog and control tower in a few moments. Uh, the other one that we're going to talk about is Control Tower, and I am so happy that it was GA today. Um, we were hoping that that was going to be announced today, and super excited about it just because of the potential it has to make life easier for you. Right? It becomes complicated trying to figure out IT in general. You have people trying to communicate with each other, you're trying to develop standards, you're trying to deploy stuff, you're trying to bring value, but there's a lot of technical dependency underneath the hood that people have to figure out and they have to work through. And with Control Tower, it makes it so that you don't have to worry about the intricate details of having to do every single thing and maintaining the configurations, maintaining all of that yourself anymore. One of the premises for AWS is to try and uh, remove a lot of the undifferentiated heavy lifting, the commodity stuff of IT, so that you can focus on the business value, so you can improve your processes, you can improve your security, you can do the things you need to so that your, your business, your organization, your uh, mission for your agency, that that can thrive. And Control Tower brings that potential to you and the ability to have a multi-account environment where you can set up guardrails that limit what uh, people can do, namely developers, right? You can put the, the guardrails on developers for what they can do, but they can go run and develop what they want without you being concerned about um, risk in your environment growing because they're going and doing uh, things without you watching everything or having to check everything because you have the guardrails in place that secure the risk that you need to secure, and you have the flexibility for your developers to do what they need to do as well, right? And it's the best of both worlds, or at least it's a step towards getting there. And that's really the goal. We all want to have that easy button. We want the best of both worlds. And through Control Tower, that's one of the ways that we can get through there. Um, so, yep, we're gonna talk through uh, the architecture a little bit about what we've been working with the World Bank on. Um, this is gonna kinda identify how that works, and then we're gonna run through a scenario for you to show you kinda what it's implemented like um, in terms of how you can do a DevSecOps pipeline, how you can identify a control or a configuration or a misconfiguration that you can identify through that DevSecOps pipeline and then have that deployed into an environment. So here's the diagram. A lot of stuff going on here, and I apologize for that, but uh, sometimes IT can be a little complicated. But we're gonna stop from, or start from, I'm looking your top left, right? So you have the developers with applications. One of the best ways to make it so you can have controls in place for your environment is gonna be to create patterns, design patterns, right? And that's the beginning of the, the standardization piece. If a developer decides that they're willing to go through this design pattern and say, I'm, I'm gonna deploy my app. Normally we do this, but I'm gonna follow this pattern here. And by following this pattern, it might take me a couple hours to get approval for my application to get uh, put into production or into the environment that I want versus weeks for a manual uh, inspection of the environment. That's an incentive to them to say, okay, I'm willing to start following along with some of these cloud patterns and make life easier so that we can actually drive our applications and bring value to our end customers and make it so that the developers get what they need, the business gets what it needs, and the security teams get what they need. All right, so you develop these application patterns, whether it's gonna be a Fargate cluster with an RDS database and some S3 storage, something like that, right? But it, it depends on every customer. Some customers, it might all be serverless. Some customers, it might still be EC2. Um, it depends, right? It depends on your use case and where you are on your journey. So you develop these patterns, and then you use CloudFormation um, to uh, build out the infrastructure that you need for those patterns based on the requirements that uh, the application needs and what the security needs. And then you run it through that DevSecOps pipeline. All right, and all this stuff can be automated. Once you do a code check, it'll get run through the pipeline down there at the bottom that we saw before. And that pipeline, once it gets approved, it will end up running through and get it can get deployed into service catalog with the approved configurations already there in place. So you know that this is a known good uh, configuration that meets your security requirements and that has managed your risk, but it's also, also the application that performs what the developers intended that the business units need, All right? And then that can get deployed into service catalog so that the end consumers can consume that application and start deploying it out in the environments knowing that it's configured um, properly. Now the reason why I have the, the big dark area on the top, this, this is the representation of what Control Tower essentially looks like. And this is a standardized way to deploy environments within AWS. 
one of the key principles, you know, we're talking about security, the security teams, they have to have visibility into the environment. They have to see what's going on and you have to be able to centralize all the logs and log data. So this is a, an example of that where when you deploy control tower, you have a centralized audit capability and a centralized logging security capability or account that you can aggregate all that data into and then um, you can deploy through what's called account factory a whole bunch of different accounts as you're deploying new applications. If you need new accounts, you can deploy them that all fit within the guardrails that you've already identified, right? And you can automate this whole process from the top left, the developer, all the way to the production environment and all this stuff. If you put the work ahead of time to do those guardrails, get everything set up, this can be done in a short period of time. You're not talking about weeks or months to get applications deployed. You're talking about, you know, potentially minutes, depending on the size of the application. Um, so we're not going to Q&A because we've only been here for 30 minutes. So I'm going to see about this demo here. And there we go. Um, so a couple questions. First off, how many people here have workloads running in AWS for their organization? Awesome. Now, out of all you that have workloads running, how many of you just have one account in your organization or in your company? So there's a few of you, but the majority don't. So what I'm seeing is that through the process of elimination and data-driven technologies in my brain, um, that multi-account matters, right? Multi-account does matter, and when you're starting to add multiple accounts, what can happen is that can increase the complexity, and when you increase complexity, sometimes you can have misconfigurations, you can have mistakes. Unfortunately, us as people, sometimes we make mistakes, right? The ability to eliminate or remediate or mitigate, how many can I rhyme with, to mitigate these mistakes becomes uh, extremely valuable for customers, right? So Control Tower does that for you. Now, what you're seeing here is actually part of a, uh, a code pipeline. And what we have in this code pipeline is, I'm there in the developer, and, um, I have an application that's being developed, and we have a, uh, this is uh, some of the code for uh, validating what the parameters are for this application that they want to get deployed. And one of the things we can talk about, right, is, and what we're going to look at right here, this is a simple example, but the idea is, okay, so you have a certain IP space that you're using. This could be a security group name, it could be an ALB name, it could be anything you really want it to be. Right, and you'll have a whole bunch of these as part of your security checks, but I just want to show you the power of what you can do just with one simple thing. And right now, I am a, a developer and I'm pointing in, uh, putting this in there, and I accidentally typed in uh, the wrong IP address when I was uh, getting my code ready. And So then I put this in and I commit my changes. All right, so let's take a look here. We're gonna view the commit changes. So the system can tell, okay, this is the configuration change that was made. So it has the ability to detect these changes and know what's going on. And it identifies uh, the difference there. And I'm gonna go to this tab right here. So in this tab, you'll see that this is the pipeline part. So the pipeline, this is all automated so that there's not much you have to do. It, it, in a moment, it's gonna start kicking through and saying, hey, there's just a new commit that was done for an application and the configuration around the application, right? And this application is good, get deployed, and I have some security checks that are in place, those hooks that Andy was talking about, um, to do that. And so, hopefully the demo guys are good with me and they're gonna start this off in a second. If not, I have a video. <laughs> Um, but while we're waiting for this to, to kick off, because it's still showing three hours, um, what I'll show you here is this is part of the code check, right? So we're, we're looking for, you have a piece of code here that's looking for a specific CIDR, and if it gets the wrong CIDR, then it's going to give an error code or an exit code. And if that ex exit code isn't what we're looking for, then it's going to know, hey, this doesn't match, so I'm going to fail this pipeline. And then we're going to send this back to the developer and say, hey, look, you, we have these security requirements. You have to follow this parameter here. You have to make sure you have these parameters in your CloudFormation templates if you want to get them deployed. And we're mapping those parameters. 
and we're going to validate those before we'll allow anything to happen. Okay, and now here we go, succeeded. So just now, it got the code commit, and what you can see right now is it's going through a security scan. So the code was committed, the CloudFormation templates were uh, submitted for all of this, and now it's going through and it's looking through the configurations that you set up that match your security requirements or the checks you're looking for before uh, you'll allow anybody to deploy something into production, okay? And that's where the code that I was showing you on this other tab, it's just a file, and it's just some code that you look at, and you, you'll end up having a number of these based on the parameters that you have and uh, whatever the controls you have in your environment that, uh, that determine what risk is and what's acceptable, acceptable risk to you. So then it goes through that process of the security scan, and then what should happen is that it will not meet the requirement for it, and then it'll fail the code check. And then the process typically with that is, and Andy, tell me if I'm wrong, that means you have to walk into the, the developer's uh, cube or wherever he is and say, hey, look, we have this thing, I told you you need to do this, and this is how you get in deployment, and they're like, oh yeah, okay, I'm sorry, I'll get it taken care of. Okay, you go back and he redoes his code, and then he submits it again, and hopefully they did it based on the compliance requirements that you have, so that the next time it'll pass the code check. But right now, here we see that it failed. All right, so this is a way that you, could, you define the process, you define the controls, and then you start working with the different teams to start using that process to get their apps deployed. And again, one of the reasons is it's gonna incentivize them, because they can get those apps deployed in minutes or hours versus weeks, right? And the business units are pushing them, the customers are pushing the business units, and you know this makes everybody happier. And you can start deploying your code securely and at scale. So then we'll go back to uh, the configuration. And then we'll fix our mistake here. So I'm a developer, I'm going back and saying, oh yeah, I need to use this other IP address because that's part of the security requirements we have. So do that. Scroll down and I guess we gotta put this in here and save them. And then commit the changes. And again, it all gets automated, and you know, once again, we can show the screen right here that shows, okay, this was the old config, this is the new config. Um, so it has the auditability, right? And auditability is definitely important in understanding what controls are in place and who did what and all that, so you definitely wanna be able to have the ability to audit. And then it'll start kicking off another pipeline. Uh, based on this check right here, they're looking for uh, IP space. But again, it can be security groups, it can be anything else. And I'll just go up here and eventually this will start kicking off. All right, so this is, these are the, the technologies and the, the techniques that customers are using to deploy into production based off of security requirements from teams like Andy that are responsible for managing the risk within an organization. And it's a, the goal is to make it easier. And it's not always easy uh, on premise or in life when you're dealing with people, but when you can build out automations and you can incentivize people based on what's best for everybody, that does make things a little bit easier, and the cloud is a great way to start doing that. Um, and, yep, so it's successful just now. Just, you know, it's going through this. It's gonna take a few moments to go through the code check. Oh, look at that, it's going faster. Okay, so now it's going into, it's unzipping and, and uploading the files to S3, and then it's gonna update the code pipeline and deploy the pipeline. But the end result ends up being that the pipeline gets put into an application uh, or it gets uh, populated into your service catalog. Okay, so service catalog is the, as we talked about, the ability to take your code, take your environments, and you can have it just like this. It's a box and a screen that if you click that box, you can deploy the application. It could be a whole bunch of things that are in there that you're deploying. Um, and then it's all, but it's all pre-approved and it matches what you need. And the more you can get your parameters in place and standardize on your configurations and standardize on the, um, uh, the types of applications that you're doing, uh, the better off it is for you. 
Now, right here, what we're gonna go through at this point is we're gonna jump into a view of what control tower looks like. All right, so we have the application that gets deployed into service catalog, but what does it look like in the control tower environment when, um, oh yeah, when the application gets deployed? So what I did is I just logged into the, con uh, the control tower account and I clicked on the control tower service. This is where you do your management for the control tower environment. Everything that you create, you wanna work through the control tower console to create your environments and manage your environments there because it gives you lots of tools. It gives you a dashboard to identify the organizations and the accounts that you have that are under management within the control tower environment. It gives you information about the guardrails that are in place and the status of compliance, for example. So it gives you a lot of good pieces of information just from the dashboard. And from here you can uh, go further. So let's look at, just to show you, um, so the organizational units, it gives you a custom and core. Those are the ones that are uh, default that come out of control tower, but you can create more. And then it gives you information about the different accounts and looks like I have a non-compliant account right over here as well. So th what that means is that there's something in my environment that is not following uh, some of the guardrails that were put in place. And that gives me the ability to say, okay, what's going on here? Did something, somebody change it outside of control tower? What's going on? And I can start looking at it and uh, do remediation to get it back into compliance for where we're trying to go. And then we can go down here and look at uh, the guardrails. And the guardrails are really a huge benefit. Um, right now there's a subset of guardrails. We primarily today, I think there's uh, there are preventative and detective controls that are in place for the guardrails for control tower. The preventative controls are primarily implemented through the mechanism of security control policies, SCPs. So if you're familiar with organizations and you're familiar with SCPs, they are the preventative controls, which means if you have an SCP in place, somebody cannot uh, deploy something that violates that SCP. It'll fail. So those are the pre preventative controls we have in place. The other ones are detective controls, and those are primarily supported by uh, control, I'm sorry, AWS config and config rules. And so those, it'll provide you with information about something being non-compliant, and then you can either do auto remediations, which config supports some auto remediations today, or you can have a manual process, or you can uh, create your own custom remediations, right, to get things back into compliance. Um, so there's a whole number of these, primarily the example, or there's a number of, I guess the best example for right now is uh, it doesn't allow any account except for the security account to edit or do anything with the permissions on the log files, right? Because that's part of the auditability, auditability capability and you want to make sure that nobody can tamper with your log files. Because if there's an issue and you're doing a forensics uh, investigation or anything like that, you have to validate that those log files are good and with the controls that are come out of the box from the control tower, it deploys the environment so, such that only people that are in the security account that have that rule can actually do anything with those log files. And there's nobody else in any of the accounts that are deployed that can, that can even touch them. They're not even focused on them. They're focused on their accounts through the account factory. And then you can have a multi-account environment where you have those guardrails in place, again, so you can um, be secure, but also be fast and agile. Um, so let's go back here just to <laughs> of course. Well, I guess we're not going to go back there because I have to go back to my email to get to the link to get in there. But um, I guess you have to tell me. It's, uh, it passed the check. Once it goes through, we have the ability to, to evaluate all the, the different rules we have and then uh, close it out. And at this point, I think we uh, outdid ourselves on time. <laughs> Are there any uh, closing comments or any, any closing Closing thoughts or anything like that you guys have at this point? Oh, would love to take some questions. Okay. If the audience well, has. So that's what we have for you. Um, I guess I'm going to go back to. Yes, please. There we go. Thank you very much.